which brings from beneath your frothing golden strands that hang as sand cascades to hand a look from you. My time getting ready so he can say how long I take and how typical it is and I smile. Hello, Chris O'Connor, Kikid, Atad, Edwin Councillor. Do we? I'm Edwin Councillor. I'm the parish priest here at St Isidore's in Flandreet Major, and the warmest of welcomes. What a wonderful space to be in. It's not bad, is it? Would you like to tell me a little bit about uh, the significance of uh, of this particular space to the local community, and uh, uh, maybe anything else that? Uh, uh, the church serves us. Thanks, I'd be, I'd be delighted to. Um, and I'm actually I'm really pleased we're here because I've just walked through the most significant feature in this building. First of all, because it's a Norman archway. Um, I've had people come into this church and say, oh, can you show me the Norman archway? And in my heart of hearts, I think, you need to get out a wee bit more. Um, this is significant for me, yes, because it's a historic feature, but look, the door, it's the gateway. Unless you come across the door, Across the threshold, you're never going to experience the, the, the wonder of this place. Um, and I suppose we've worked really hard on what, what we've called radical hospitality. Um, a welcome sign. It sometimes can mean, well, you know, yes, welcome unless. This means welcome because, bringing everything that you are into this space. And for me, that's crucial when we serve the, the community of Clantwick Major and beyond here. So I want people to bring everything of themselves, of their, their life journey, their story, and that connection with that, that little bit inside us that makes us go out on a dark night, look up into the sky and say, whoa. Um, if you bring that same faith gene, as I call it, into this place, you look around and think about the generations of people who've come here on their best days and on their worst days as well, and found comfort and solace and community in the midst of all this. Now, one of the, the great connections that we've had, of course, has been through the work we do with uh, the local community through um, lots of art projects, and, and that covers a wide range of things. Uh, we've got an art project in progress at the moment that we're calling Lines of Thought, and we're inviting people to come in and to sketch and draw and paint and to see the building, perhaps in a, a way they haven't quite seen it before. But we've also extended that into a writing project as well, and working with the local writing group, uh, inviting them to so not just think about the history and the, 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 the facts and pinning those down, but actually thinking about the human stories that lie behind that history, the real people in real time who've inhabited this place over centuries. So I moved to Landwit Major five years ago from uh, Caerphilly, just outside of Cardiff, and um, I was an English teacher, I've just retired as an English teacher, and had later in life come to writing, um, something I'd always wanted to do, I, I joined a writing group uh, in Cardiff, John Blake, who used to run um, writing sessions in Butte Park. I did many of his courses and they, they were brilliant. I absolutely loved it. So I moved to Lantwick Major and thought, I want to continue to write. I'll join a writing group. But the only writing groups available were in the afternoon. And of course, I was in work as a school teacher in the afternoon. So what do you do if something doesn't exist? Well, you call it into being. So I put a call out on, on local media and on Facebook and um, people came. It was as if they were waiting for somebody to start a writing group. And the quality of people, I mean, I was in the staff room at school and I had an email from Phil Caradice saying, I'd like to join your writing group. And I taught Phil's, one of Phil's books, The Boson's Secret, in a previous school I taught at. So that gives you something of the idea of the quality of writers. People came who, like me, were aspirational writers. I mean, I, I've got an academic background, so I'd, I'd done lots of that kind of writing, but not imaginative work very much. But people who, like Phil, has written over 86 books, people like Laura Sheldon that uh, has uh, got three books published and has got a contract for another one, and then people like Sarah Pershing, who is just the most glorious writer, who, who, I'm, who is studying writing an MA in, in Swansea, and I'm sure will be a very successful poet and we've over the last couple of years just become tremendous friends and actually what grew out of that was a one day literature festival in 2021 and what grew out of that was this um, 
three, these three streams festival, which is writing, art and music, which has been successful now two years in a row and we're already planning next year. So it's, it's one of those things from little acorns, you know, oak trees can grow, but it needs, they need nurturing, they need, they need, um, they need light, they need feeding and the talent in this area has provided that. It's really unbelievable. So what are these all about? Well, this is one of the hidden gems of this church. It's a, we've got, in this corner, three stone effigies. Um, the oldest one, this one, dating back about 800 years. Uh, this one a little bit younger, and one from Elizabethan times towards the, uh, the end of the, uh, the 16th century. Um, they've always been here, and they, they tell a story of three particular people in particular situations. Um, and I'll be honest, they've, um, they're a, a bit of a trip hazard. <laughs> uh, so having them here, in one sense, it, we, can, we can view them here, but they're, they're big old things. So we've been trying to highlight them a little bit, so that's hence the displays that we've got here. Um, and we're trying to encourage people to, to maybe look at them and, and just see something of them because the detail in them is, is just fantastic. Um, this one here is, is the oldest one. Um, it, we think it may be connected to one of the, um, the priests who was here um, looking after this because we had the, the parish church back into the history of the place which is the, the middle part of the church where we, uh, we, we came in through the main door. This that we have as the, the, the working church uh, today. Uh, this was built about 100 years later in the uh, uh, probably in the 1200s. And it became not a monastery, don't think of a, you know, cowl over the head monastery, but a, a, a chapter of priests would have just prayed 24-7. And when the, the Normans came and extended their reach to this part of the world, they kind of booted out the local clergy and brought their own people in. And we think this may well be um, a, a, an effigy that pays tribute to the, uh, the, the last of the priests here. There's actually a dedication to um, a lady on the um, reverse side there, which they think might have been his mum. Um, and so the, uh, the historians on this, they think the, the head may have been inserted afterwards and you've got your straightforward tonsured priest's head. Um, so it, it's, it's a historical quirk in that sense, but there's a real human story underneath. And the two others here, um, a 14th century lawyer, uh, the clues are in there. The man is holding a glove, which is a sign of maybe a glove court that would have been held here. Um, dressed in robes that would connect him to um, a, a, a legal graduate of Oxford or Cambridge. And of course it was the canon lawyers who were the, the civil lawyers as well. It was the early years, if you like, um, of the, uh, the code of law as we know it today. So uh, a significant person there in his day. And finally, an Elizabethan lady here. And um, again, a really significant human story. This fabulous um, carving here of the rough around the neck, feathers in the hat, and then a child at the side here. So I wonder, is it a lady who lost her life in childbirth? Um, just a really significant human story. And, and that for me is everything about, um, about what these things signify. It isn't just us finding out another bit of history. It's about us wondering, what is the human story? Now I mentioned um, when we arrived, about us connecting to the local writing group and they have taken on a project as part of our lines of thought project this, uh, this year um, and we've invited them to ponder uh, these effigies and, and not just to find out the history and another bit of fact about them but to ponder what the human story is that maybe lies behind what was going on in the life of that lawyer what were the cases that were being considered here what was the family tragedy maybe that the elizabethan lady was going through what on earth was it like when the old order was suddenly changed when, um, the, when a Norman class in their ch church was established here with new clergy and new leadership and a new way of doing things. But one other thing we've done here, we've got an interactive display. So not only have we got the writing group doing this, we're also posing questions for people and inviting them um, to fill in these little cards. And we pose some questions, you know, what would you ask these people if they were alive today? Um, how do these statues make you feel? Um, and we've had quite a few people have left their thoughts here and I just want to share two of them with you. One of them is written in Welsh. Uh, my Welsh isn't very good but um, I think what this one is trying to say as far as I can see is it's talking about the connection through time and I suppose that family tragedy, that professional relationship, that 
changing of the guard here. Those are things that happen in all of our lives in any generation. And just the way we reflect about that, that's what we're, I suppose, inviting those, the, the writing group to, to write and reflect on the reality of all of our lives, a change of job, a bereavement, a family tragedy. Um, and just the reminder in this, uh, the Welsh comment here, of just how fragile all this is. You know, life is fine and suddenly wallop in the next minute, life's turned upside down. But I've also got one, this is in the answer, answer to the question, how do these statues make you feel? And I'm guessing it's, um, it's a young person who's written here, because what they've written is, creeped out. <laughs> I love it. But it says, creeped out, but they're really cool if they were, these were actual people. And, and that is such a perceptive comment, because these were actual people. Um, yes, yeah, stone statues that we try to um, understand and, and, and give meaning and character to. But, but yeah, if it wasn't for the real people behind, and, and that for me is when the writer, the artist, the musician, suddenly speaks into the depth of what it is to be human. That's why in our worship, in our liturgy here, music is so important, that, that's that written word, it's in our scriptures, um, the art, the art of the paintings on the walls of this church, um, all those speak into deeper truths that, that help us to understand, well, really what it is to be human. Um, because it's only when you understand what it is to be human that you understand what it is to be of God. St Tilda's Church, as you've seen, is a really special place. And I, I really think there is something that draws people to Lantwit Major. And Lantwit Major is Llanilted Vaur, uh, which is the, the, the large church of St Tilted. So I think that um, St Tilted's is something to do with that. It does seem to draw people here. Whether that's a spiritual thing, I do not know. But um, certainly in terms of the write-in group, St Tilted's has been very central to it because we've held our festivals primarily there. But so, so Edwin is part of this project, in, Edwin is the vicar, is part of this project in August to encourage people to use the church to create art. So um, Lines of Thought is what they're calling this project and people are going there and there's art materials, they can create art. So I was talking to him one day and he said, well, you know, the writing group perhaps could create some lines too. And um, some, amongst some of the incredible monuments in the church are these three really enigmatic effigies. And each of them seems to have a story and stones can't speak. So, you know, you can fill that gap with imagination, which is what historical writing always does, actually. You know, I think it's something that Hilary Mantel has talked about a lot in the past. You know, the late, wonderful Hilary Mantel is the fact that we're, you know, history it's impossible to recall the past anyway, but the imaginative historical writing fills in those gaps in a way which is really much more about us as we are. You can't, you know, you can't reinvigorate. I mean, the, the, the woman with the baby at her right shoulder, um, Joan Hopkin, um, that's presumably from something like about 1580. We can't know her story. We don't even know for sure who paid for that monument to be created. Um, it could have been a husband. Some, some people think that it was um, the Earl of Pembroke, and then maybe she was his mistress, but it's hearsay. But what we can do is we can talk about how we feel about motherhood, how we feel about memory, how we feel about mortality. So, you know, it's, I think it's a wonderful project to inspire us to... Um, the past is, when you talk about the past, you're always really talking about the present, you know. So, so yes, that's what we did. We... Um, Canon Edwin Council, who's an incredible person, uh, he talked to us about the history, the known history of these three effigies. So the the, the woman with the baby, um, and then the, there's an effigy of of a man from I think around the 13th century with a glove. Um, why is it just one glove? Was he a merchant? Is it something to do with um, his trade? Again, we don't know. We're trying to fill in the blanks, but it's not a historical project. It's an imaginative project. And then the, the really interesting one as well is of um, a sarcophagus with, that is clearly for a woman because the writing on the, the inscription on the side refers to, uh, to her. But then a male monk's head has been placed on top of it. So, you know, that kind of playing with gender is quite interesting. You can do all sorts of things with those. So, you know, we're always looking for inspiration, are we, in writing? And uh, I, I think that it could be a really exciting project. I often think, what, 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 what is our purpose here? Um, and you can get really caught up just, just feeling around in the dust of history, trying to find a, you know, another little clue that, 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 that's another, you know, another building block of what we've, we've got here. 
Um, and, I, and I think what we're trying to do is to bear witness to a tradition that's been, been born out over 15 centuries. You know, what was Ishtid trying to do when he established a monastic college here in, in, in the early 500s? You know, what was it that brought people like Dewi Sant uh, here as a student? What was um, somebody like Gildas or Samson? Not the Samson of the Old Testament who pushed the, the, the pillars down, but Saint Samson who went off to be uh, a bishop in northern France. Um, what was it about Ishtid that brought them here? And, and, I, and I think it is a, a, an openness of faith, an openness and generosity of heart. Um, and finding something of the God of love in that. Um, and when, uh, I suppose, we, we, we witness to that through, through our worship and through our prayer and through our care of people. Um, but I think it's also about throwing open those doors and about inviting a community to, to own this place um, and make it their own. Because I know the people in this community who through their skills, through, through writing, through, through art, through music making, um, speak into the work that we do. Um, what, is this a bit of Greek over here? It is. I find the, the reverse of this stone um, fascinating. It's called the, the Ishtid Pillar. It would have had um, a traditional round sort of Celtic cross on the top, uh, but that's been lost in the mists of time. Um, but you come around to the back of the stone here and there are two fascinating things. First, there's a, a little bit of Greek there. Uh, some Greek characters, um, and maybe a reminder as to the, the influences that, that came to to um, to, uh, to to Ishtid's great church here. Um, not all the traditional things that came through England, they came through lots of other ways through Europe, and I think it reminds us of the, the complexity of the Celtic tradition. Now, we think this is probably around about 8th century or so, um, and I think probably you know, a couple of hundred years after Ishtid's time, and yet still they've carved his name on the back um, and you think he was still their, their poster boy and a couple of hundred years was a long time in those days uh, and, I, and you know you think when you're when you're a kid and you put your things on your bedroom wall and it's it's a band or it's a it's a footballer or whatever um, you know Ishtib was their poster boy um, you know as the traditions of Llan Ishtib went on um, and just in those, those few words, that little bit of writing there, I, I think it speaks again into so, so much of what, uh, what we inherit today. And what about this one? Uh, well, this is remarkable. It's called the, the Hewalt Cross, or the, the, uh, probably um, commissioned for someone by the name of Howell. Um, and obviously it's got a few dings and scratches from over the years, um, but all these stones were found in and around the, um, the area. The, the monastic college from 15 centuries ago would have been huge. There's as many as 2,000 students here. Um, but, but these would never have been displayed like this. Um, but they've been here for the last 10 years since it was all restored and put in place. Um, I'll just to give you a little bit of... Uh, I always think this, the top of this stone is, is almost a parable for, for our work here. It's that intersection of, of, of God and humanity. I mean, that, that is everything that this church is about. Uh, and I wonder about the guy who got up and had his breakfast and went off to work and started to, to carve this. Um, it's got a, a circle around the outside. It's got a bit bashed over the years. Um, but surrounding everything with the love of God, which is everything we try to do in this, in this church. But for me, the, the, my favourite bit, if you like, is this knot work. It's, it's almost like a, that ball of wool and it's the knottedness of life. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the pandemic and it's family and work and your football team and all those things all knotted up together. Um, and again, going back to the, the art side of things here and the, and the work of somebody like the, the, the writing group, when, when people are bold enough to share an insight and, and to write and to put it, put it out there, I think is a really brave thing to do. And very often, speak, you know, the, the, the best of writers will, will write of the, the knottedness of life. Um, and, I, and I really hope that people who are inspired by, by this place will we'll speak of that. Um, but I also speak of the, 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 the healing, the peace, the reconciliation um, that, that this place also speaks of um, and how, we, how you reconcile that, that, that uncertainty of, of human existence. For me, that's everything of our work here. And, and I think it defines the relationship we have with, with our, our artists, our musicians, and yeah, with our writers as well, uh, at the very heart of our work. Well, I, I was here the other night uh, during the launch of uh, mm. Damon Watford Davis's new collection, Viva Batali. And, yeah. uh, um, I also had the privilege, the great privilege, of reading here 
during the, these three streams, Lantern Major Festival, back in June. And, and I think it, the, the, this, there's something very special about yeah. this place in the way that uh, it connects, and it makes you feel like you're mm. connected to a greater tradition yeah. of, uh, of not just sort of, you know, uh, writing and literature, but also of learning. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very perceptive, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. Um, because, you know, we have a tradition that goes back, you know, 15 centuries that people came here, um, you know, to learn. It was, it was the place where, you know, probably those who had wealth and influence sent their children to learn. But it was also where people came with, with vocation, um, where people studied scripture. Um, I, I mean, my background is in education and I wonder what did people learn here? Uh, and there would have been, you know, doctrine, there would have been um, probably survival techniques as people went across the, the, the Bristol Channel and spread the, um, their learning from here to, through, um, through Cornwall into Brittany. Um, so, you know, a huge learning tradition here. And that's something I think it's, it's a responsibility we have today uh, to keep that tradition alive. And again, when we encourage people to, 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 to find expression through the arts, uh, I think every time somebody writes, every time somebody draws or sings here, it, it's, it's sharing those perspectives. It's part of all of our, our shared learning and engagement uh, with the traditions of this place. Mm -hmm.